Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. I am your host, Tina Muir, and I would like to thank you for listening to us today. We know you have a lot of options of where you would like to spend your time, but we appreciate you taking the time to tune in to what we have to say. Thanks again for your suggestions on how to improve the podcast. We hope to continue to make it better. And we had a great response with questions last week for our guest, Dave McGillivray. We hope you will continue to reach out to us if you have a specific question for any of our upcoming guests. We will always announce your guest a week in advance to give you time to submit a question, so keep checking out for those. If you check out runnersconnect.net slash podcast or give us a call, you can submit a question, give feedback, or just let us know what we are doing right. We, of course, love to hear that too. If you th- We think you're really going to enjoy our guest today, especially those of you who are late starters in the running world. Today we have Kathy Martin, also known as the running realtor on our show. Kathy has held or still holds US and world records in every event from the 800 to the 50k. She's also the Ben Gay Athlete of the Year in 2004. She is a nine-time Masters Cross Country Champion and was nominated the USATF Masters Athlete of the Year. She's graded at close to 100% in almost every distance she's competed in, and has been featured by the New York Times, and even had her uh, Nike commercial made about her, which you can check out on her website, katherineamartin.com. In today's episode, we're going to learn about how Kathy Martin has changed the rules when it comes to running as a master, how she went from being not able to run even one mile without lying on the ground at age 30 to becoming a Masters World Record holder in a number of events. She's going to talk about the importance of listening to your body at any age and what Kathy does to stay healthy, how you can fit in your training with a full-time job, and Kathy's advice on how you can compete at a high level within your age group. We think it's going to be a great show and we look forward to hearing your feedback. So let's get to it. So welcome, Kathy, to the Runners Connect Running to the Top podcast. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. We're very excited to have you. So firstly, uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, your story, beginning with that day where you ended up lying on the road at age 30 and how that became the defining moment where you realized something needed to change? Sure. Um, My husband's always been a runner. And so one day I just thought I could go out and run a mile with him or whatever. He would eat a big pasta dinner and go run five miles. So one night I thought I'll go run with him. And I laid down on the road. I absolutely couldn't run. And I remember him standing over me going, get up, a car's going to hit you. And I'm just looking at him going, good, I hope it does. And that was the beginning it was like one of those aha moments in life that I realized I'm only 30 years old and I can't run a mile if I don't do something about it. By the time I'm 60, I won't be able to walk. So that was a real defining moment. And every day I just promised myself I would do one more telephone pole, one more mailbox, and that's what I did. And that's great. It just shows you that small changes, you know, it doesn't have to be one big jump of I'm going to run a marathon. It's just building it up slowly and you know, taking taking it one step at a time or one lamppost at a time. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, you started out later than the traditional runner, but uh, you started breaking national and world records as a master's. What advice would you give to those who think that their running life is over by the time that the traditional age of 25 to 30 that most people think about as the end? it's really the beginning um i would say just get out there just get out and put one foot in front of the other for me that's really what it was is just put one foot in front of the other get the body moving you know all we're really trying to do is slow down the slowing down process Mm -hmm. i mean you know nature's going to take its course but we want to be i think we're so healthy conscious and so aware we just want to be the healthiest we can be no matter what the age is so I encourage everybody just get out there just put one foot in front of the other Um, I always loved the quote from Satchel Paige who said how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were 
And it's true. How old would you be? I certainly wouldn't think I'm 63. Yeah. And, you know, so, and, and the other thing I say to that is all excuses are equal. You know, just get out and do it. We can find a thousand excuses. We're wives, mothers, grandmothers, we were, you know, whatever it is. You just have to incorporate some kind of exercise into your deal, a daily routine. It's like you don't go to bed without brushing your teeth. You don't go to bed without doing some form of exercise. And I understand running is not for everybody, but do something, walk, you know, something. Run the stairs. <laughs> no, that's great and very good advice there. Uh, something that is realistic for everyone. So you mentioned that uh, you're you are busy and you know everyone. It's not for everyone, but everyone can make time for it. So you work in real estate, which is a very stressful job and requires long hours. How do you yeah. use your training as a stress reliever? Well, I always say I do my best thinking when I'm out running, whatever the problem is that may be facing me when I go out the door is never the same problem mm -hmm. when I turn. There's just solutions out there. And sometimes you just need to remove yourself, you know, from the situation. And, and it just gives you clarity of thought. I, I honestly do my best thinking when I'm out there running, not with music, not to say that you know, it's not acceptable to some people. For me, it's not. I just love to commune with nature. I love to go on the trails. I love to do the boardwalk. Uh, you know, it just get out there and run. It doesn't cost anything. You just put on your shoes and get out the door. So you would say that you do a lot of your problem solving and just go over things that you need to do. Or I, I find sometimes during my runs that I end up planning out my day so that I know exactly what I'm doing when I get back. Do you find you yes. use it to your advantage for working? Absolutely, I do. As I say, I do my best thinking when I'm out there running. I do plan the day. I find, I know so many people say you should plan your day the evening before, but a lot of times by the time you wind down in the evening, I don't have the mental acuity, <laughs> I guess, to do the, the planning for the next day. So that's typically when I do it. I mean, I have a basic outline, but yes, that's the best. And, and the problems are no longer problems. You found solutions. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. Actually, you would be interested. Uh, last week, we talked to Dave McGillivray, the Boston Marathon race director, and he talked about how he um, takes a voice recorder with him on his runs. And oh. he, t he speaks out his thoughts and speaks out things so that he doesn't come back and think, oh, what did I, what did I think about? What was, that I was, what was that great idea I had? He, I thought that was quite interesting that he uh, thought about doing that, and it makes a lot of sense. It really does. It's funny because when I go at the door to run, I go unadorned with any any equipment. I don't have a phone. I don't have, you know, radio. I don't have anything. But that's a really good point because you do. You get back and you think, oh, what, what was that great thought I had out there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you run most of your uh, training in the mornings. Uh, what time do you work out? Usually. I typically am out the door as soon as it's light. Um, this time of the year, it's a little harder because it doesn't <laughs> light till after seven. But typically, I just get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee and put on the running clothes and go out the door. I don't think about, am I going to run today? What time am I going to run? That's just been my routine for so many years. It's just my lifestyle now. That's good because a lot of people, you know, say they're too busy or they're too tired to fit in running or after work, it's too much effort. But um, what would you say to those people who have used that excuse or are just struggling with the motivation to get themselves going? Well, I think it's always good to have an accountability partner. So if there's anybody that you can do it with, that's always great because you might be tempted to crawl back into bed and not go that day. <laughs> Or it's a little drizzle outside, but you know if somebody else is meeting you, you're not going to disappoint them. Um, I think that, you know, there's a thousand and one excuses we could all use. Everybody's too busy. You know, we live in a time-starved world. But you just have to say, what's the cost of good health? What's the cost of poor health? And I think when we look at the health issues that are facing us as a society, you know, the obesity, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, you know, and you you deserve it. I say to everybody, you deserve that time. You deserve good health, but only you are in charge of it. Yeah. You can't abdicate that responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And uh, it, it is important to put in the time now. And, you know, like you mentioned earlier, running doesn't cost a lot of money. All, all you really need are your running shoes. So uh, isn't it better to put in that time and the way of looking after your body now rather than getting to 
your later years when things really start to go wrong and it's too late. It's too late. That's, I think, typically what happens. The other great thing about running is that no matter where you are, you can run. Mm -hmm. You know, you just get out the door. I mean, we've, and I've seen some beautiful places in the country and in the world as a result of running. So one of the things I do is plan a vacation around a race. You know, if you're going somewhere to race, you stay a couple extra days if it fits in. So it just, you incorporate in, incorporate it into your lifestyle. Yeah. But that's really what it has to be as a lifestyle. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great way of looking at it. It's, as you mentioned earlier, not making a big change, but slowly making those adjustments to make sure that it stays in your life rather than taking an unrealistic goal, which is sometimes what we can do with a lot of things. But particularly people who start out running, they get a little bit too excited at first, but can't quite make it into that lifestyle like you mentioned. So um, what would you say about, do you have any thoughts on the influx of runners who are at the opposite end, end of the spectrum, who are now competing at a high level and racing in distance events such as the marathon as teenagers. Do you have any thoughts on the longevity of that? Or I'm not well versed in, you know, the teenage years and running and marathons. I think I would tend to be hesitant about encouraging it. Um, I think a lot of it, and I don't know what age that the bone plates close and that sort of thing but I think also the long-term effects I think you could burn out like I, I'll talk to masters runners who started running later in life you know 30 40 whatever and they have fresh legs and they're just really enjoying it as opposed to people maybe who ran all through high school and ran through college and they're feeling the effects of it of all those years so just to me I would be I, I would probably tend to be very cautious about it. I know there's a couple of great, you know, teenage females that are out there have done some phenomenal times in the marathons, but I would just caution them. And, you know, for all of us, it's what's your lifetime goals and what are your, what are your short-term, mid-term, long-range goals? You know, do you want to run as a lifestyle when you're 60 or is it you want to go out with a blast in your 20s? I don't know. It's every <laughs> individual, seriously. Um, but I would be concerned about the long-term, you know, impact if we could all afford one of the um, what are those zero gravity treadmills? Oh, the Alt G. <laughs> we could all afford one of those. Yeah, the Alt G ones. You wouldn't have to worry about the impact. Yeah, yeah, very true. I, I haven't had the luxury of running on one of those, but I know they're they're very uh, good at what they do. <laughs> if you need, I them. just tried it. We were at um, I ran the eight k in uh, Philly. And they had one set up at the expo, so I tried it. It's very different, but it was great. Yeah, great for uh, recovering from injuries, coming back. Exactly. <laughs> so talking, speaking of that, you uh, have become very good at listening to your body. And uh, in an interview you did with the New York Times, you talked about scratching out of the USATF championships in March 2012 to prevent further damage to your knee. Why would you say it's, so important to listen to your body about those kind of things when you know often as runners we can ignore those and push through and think oh it's going to be okay but how have you learned to listen to those little warning signs well I think you know the more you run or you are in tune with your body you know how you know what fuels your body you know when you're fatigued like I can tell when I'm on the track, let's say if I'm doing a track workout and I'm I'm breathing hard or I'm working too hard for where I am in the workout, uh, you know, my husband who's also my coach has just pulled me off the track and just said, not today, you know, you're just not there. You have to listen to it. Um, with regard to when the New York Times did the article, um, I had been having issues with my knee. I hadn't had an MRI. I thought it was just muscular. It, it never felt like severe pain I never thought I just couldn't run it was like there was a disconnect between the the knee area and the brain it was just mm -hmm. like it wasn't connecting the brain was telling it to run but it couldn't run and we got to Bloomington for the um I think that was the indoor nationals and I went out to warm up and I just it the disconnect was just there it, it was, so it's like it was one of the hardest things I think I've ever done was just to admit defeat and just say, yeah. I can't do it. But I knew the long-term effect was, you know, my goal is to run for my whole life. And so I knew that if I pushed it there, even if I was able to get on the track and do it long-term, I knew there was damage being done because I, I just, the pain was there. It just wouldn't let me do it. 
Yeah, and that's good that you were able to listen um, and know that even though, like you said, it's interesting that you feel like you could have done it, you could have pushed through and done it, but you knew in your heart that the sacrifice wasn't worth it. And again, it comes back to that lifestyle change of what is more important to you. And I know a lot of younger um, athletes, myself included, can sometimes think that th that specific moment is more important than your entire lifestyle and longevity of running. But at the end of the day, there's always another race and you've kind of come to prove that. Exactly. Exactly. There is always another race. And it's just, it's just not worth it. I, I see runners all the time and they're pushing through yeah. things and it's like your body is telling you, listen to what it's telling you. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to just pay attention. And I think as an example, when I was younger, when I first started running, I never stretched. My husband used to stretch and my friend that I ran with used to stretch <laughs> and I used to just take off and run. And then as you get older, you realize you have to listen to your body. You have to stretch. You know, otherwise there's going to be some consequences. <laughs> so you do make that a regular part of your training now? I do now. Every day when I finish running, I do at least five or ten minutes of stretching. Just, you know, loosening up the body. I'll try to do like the skipping and the hopping and do some backward runs mm -hmm. and that sort of thing also. And it, you know what? It also keeps the joy in running. It keeps it fun. Yep, you know, yep. you look like a kid skipping down the road. <laughs> um, but it's just so important. Mm -hmm. and, it is, and it is, you know, you look at a child and you see them seeing running as something that is joy. They, get, they run across the room and you see that smile on their face. But a lot of the time we can forget that and think that see it as a chore or see it as, oh, I still have this to go. Or, That's great uh -huh. that you, you are able to look back and, you know, take some advice from children and have fun with it. And I would say if running becomes a second job, I'm giving it up. I don't need it. <laughs> So you do. I think my advice to runners all the time is just keep the joy in it. Keep the fun in it. We're just children out there playing. That's really what we are. Mm -hmm. exactly. And so you have to keep that fun in it. Yeah, no, that's great. So um, to keep healthy, as we talked about, um, you, you do have what, what is called Team Martin, um, <laughs> <laughs> composing of your strength coach, chiropractor, massage therapist, physical therapist, and a plyometric trainer. Do you still use all of those regularly? And how important would you say Team Martin are to your success? They're absolutely critical to the success. I use them as I need them. Like, for instance, I, number one, I think it's, it's very important. I train at a high level. And we're always pushing the envelope and your body needs to recover from that. So for me, having a massage at least once every two weeks, I try to schedule it in because your legs have to be flushed and then they, they have to be nourished. So, and I can just feel it like just recently, I think it probably was a month between times when I had a massage and my legs were just feeling like concrete. There was no elasticity. There was no movement in them. So massage is critical. And the others I just use as I need to. Like I can tell I have a, a situation that my pelvis will go out a little bit. And I can just tell it's a tweak here, a tweak there. Or I'll feel it in my knee and I know what it is. So I'll call up the physical therapist and say, okay, Mark, I need a 100,000 mile tune up. Yeah. And when chiropractor, you know. We start very young in life, falling down and, you know, compressing the spine and doing all those things. So it's just fine tuning, keeping you in, for me, it's just keeping me in race shape. I don't use them all the time, um, but I do use them as I need them. And I always laugh, you know, people will ask all the time, oh, Kathy, I have this issue, I have that issue, what should I do? And when I tell them, you know, have a massage, they'll go spend $100 for dinner, but they won't spend $100 to have a massage or $50 or whatever the cost is. And yet the long-term goal is to keep running forever. Mm -hmm. You have to be kind to your body. Yep, it always comes back to this. And uh, so you're saying that the money invested into those little things like massage, like getting the appropriate recovery are you know, more important. And when people think about what they want and the, all the hours and the time you put in, you those little things can make all the difference like you mentioned about you know you could tell when you hadn't been there for a month so even if someone hasn't been very good at it in the past it doesn't mean that it's necessarily too late and you can still go back to it all the time and it will help 
Is that absolutely, absolutely. It's just keeping the body functioning the way it's supposed to function. That's what you know. All the professionals do whatever their specialty is. It's just keeping the body functioning. Mm -hmm. So yes, I I strongly encourage it. So do you have a specific strength program that you do with exercises to supplement your training, or do you just go in as you said if something is bothering you to uh, strengthen that particular area? Well, I, I have um, a functionality, I guess to call them a functionality coach right now. And it's just all about, like, for instance, keeping the hips loose. That's the tightest part for me, just keeping the hips loose. And when we're running, it's always a linear movement. So, But we have to do other things. So you have to keep your proprioceptors responding in your ankles and your body if you're doing cross country. So it's different professionals for different things depending on where you are one of the most common things I see with runners is um, you know we have a, a body mass loss after age 50 and I think it's something like two to three percent a year and you see with people with their body mass dwindling because all they're doing is running well for instance you know, if you're losing the mass, say, around your shoulders and you see that kind of emaciated look, you don't have the strength in your upper body to propel you forward. So you have to do something. You can't just run. I mean, you can, but you're, the slowing down is going to be at a greater rate, I think. Mm -hmm. And then you're working against your body and running becomes less joyful. Exactly. And how many times a week would you say you incorporate those exercises? into your training i try to do a workout with a trait with my trainer um the functionality at least once a week i'll do it twice a week if it's not too close to races and that sort of thing but typically i'd say it's about once a week is probably what i average okay yep we find that's uh really important and we actually have a strength program at runners connect that we are always recommending to people because it is important and i myself as a runner really you know see the importance in it but people often think that you can get away with not doing those little exercises but they are like you say it fundamentally important to being able to run and keeping that joy in the running so you're you're right it's on. not a luxury i think people think of it as a luxury it's not a luxury it's, i think of it more as a necessity mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, so do you think you think everyone needs these to stay healthy, but what other things would you say that people need, especially as they age, to stay healthy? Do you take supplements? Do you take any other? Do you have a focus on particular nutrients in your diet, or is there anything you, you make a focus on as, as you have aged? Um, I started yoga a few years ago, and I find yoga is probably the best complementary exercise you can do no matter what your sport is yoga is keeping you stretched also mm -hmm. I don't do it to twist like a pretzel I do it just <laughs> for stretching um, so I think yoga is great in terms of supplements I do I take magnesium zinc vitamin E I have multivites but I'm not good at taking it um, a vitamin D also um, and that's that's pretty much it okay hydration is critical I I love food. I'm a real food. So, um, you know, my favorite meal is steak and a baked potato and a glass of red wine. So mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I try to be careful and I try to be cognizant of putting good food in like in the morning, if at all possible, have a shake with, you know, fresh fruit or frozen fruit and yogurt and, you know, coconut oil and flax oil and all those things. So I would say I'm good at least half the time. Um, but I think you, you just be aware of what's good nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, you know, something that's universal to everyone and is, uh, eat healthy, but you know, you can still enjoy things that are a little bit, uh, on the naughty side, but in moderation. <laughs> so it's good to see that. Eight percent of the time your mm -hmm. body can withstand the assault for the other 20. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> So um, in November, you were um, announced as USATF's uh, Athlete of the Week after winning the Masters 5K Cross Country Championships. Um, and you talked about uh, wanting there to be more attention on Masters running and respect within it. Um, so what do you think needs to happen to encourage uh, more Masters athletes to participate? And what would you say needs to be done to bring more attention to it? 
you know, I don't understand why particularly women masters are fearful. I think it's more of fear of the cross country. You know, my husband has a great correlation. He said, you know, as guys, he said, when you're out starting at a young age, you jump over things, you just run, you jump over and probably girls and women don't jump over things as much as guys do. So they don't have the hesitation. I don't know why women, I think it's more of a fear. I know I never considered it even in even track. I never ran track when I started running and we have a delightful 95 year old gentleman here on Long Island who used to send me communiques, written communiques <laughs> from track meets and go, Kathy, you can do this. Kathy, you can beat this time. And uh, that's how I got started. But there was some fear and there was some trepidation. And I remember doing the first cross country meet or one of the early ones up in Santa Barbara. And it was, you know, pouring rain and wind and hay bales. And I remember thinking, I hate this. What am I doing? <laughs> and then, you know, you just say, get over it, try it again. And now I love cross country. So you would say cross country is your favorite of the three? Um, I couldn't say it's my favorite. I just, I love the variety. I think if I just focused on one, I'd be bored. Mm -hmm. I say I have a attention span. Um, I love all of them. I love track when I'm doing it. I love the roads. I love, I love the rhythm of the roads. I love the speed of the track. And I guess it's a, it's a different challenge as the cross country. Mm -hmm. So it just keeps the variety in it. Yep, yep. And uh, going back to what we were talking about before with the Masters Racing and uh, bringing more uh, participation rates up, uh, do you think it could be partly because of the way things are in America? I know, I mean, I'm from England and uh, everyone aged 22 onwards, from 22 to, you know, 92, you could see someone in, in cross country and track and in road races all, all out there together because you're all considered seniors and everyone runs together. I mean, there are the breakdowns of masters, but it seems that there's a greater encouragement for uh, older athletes to compete together, even when it comes to, you know, national cross country things. And would you say, what could you recommend changing within the American system of running that we could encourage more masters athletes to participate and people, you know, who are older, but still running to still you know, compete out there in some bigger, bigger events? I think a lot of it has to be word of mouth. I mm -hmm. think we have to encourage each other and, and get the word out there that the events, I think sometimes people just don't know. They don't know to go to USATF website if they're not, you know, if they haven't been doing cross country, let's say they don't know to go there. So I think it's up to us as runners to get that information out there and encourage people to come. It was so great in Bethlehem to have 300 masters, I think it was over 300 masters women running. That was phenomenal. That's the most it's ever been. I think that was the biggest meet, you know, that's been. So that was very encouraging. I think just, you know, encouraging each other to get out there and do it, increasing awareness for people. I know USATF is trying to you know, incorporate some things like that. I think they're doing, um, if you've never done it before, I think there was maybe free or um, diminished cost for entering the events and things like that. I mean, I think they really are trying to get more people out and, and you have to make it worthwhile. No, that's that's great. And uh, do you see, you see it continuing to move? Have you seen uh, movement since, you know, since you've been a master's athlete over the last few years? Do you think it is moving in the right direction? I do. I mean, I've run races in the past where there would be like maybe 20 women running the race. And now, as I say, the last one we had, I think it was over 300. So that's definitely encouraging. And I was asking why so many there? What, what, a, you know, what brought them out? I think part of it is they may have run there, men and women may have run there in their college years. And so it was a great opportunity for them to come back mm -hmm. and, because it seemed like everybody knew the course. Yeah. So that may have been part of it. But again, hopefully some of it, we're just getting the message out there. That's good. Yeah, I think, I think we, I've discussed this with other people a little bit about uh, the course makes a huge difference. And that Lehigh course, like you mentioned, that's a very well-known course. And a lot of people do run on that. And it is, it's a fun course. I think a lot of that, especially for cross country, is important getting a course that is enjoyable and not just running around a golf course three or four times. So exactly <laughs> makes a difference. Um, so uh, what is next for you running wise? I mean, you, you want to keep chasing those records, but is there a specific race you're training for? 
Well, next will be indoor track and field, the Masters Indoor Track and Field. Okay. Um, I think it's the end of February or no, I'm sorry, but the third week of March, I think is when it is. That's in Winston-Salem. So that's always fun. Mm -hmm. it, just thinking about running, you were commenting there, and it was like just the camaraderie that's out there. You know, we're we're competitors, certainly as masters, we're competitors when you toe the line, no matter what it is, and you're warriors out there in the field, and yet off the field, you're hugging and so happy to see each other, and see, so happy to see each other healthy and still competing, and it's that kind of camaraderie that I I just love it. I you know when you see people, you develop friendships all over the world. Oh yeah, definitely. No, that that's that's a that's a great point there, and especially as you age, that's one thing that is, you know, again in that interview with Dave McGillivray, he talked about being younger and you're all competitive with everyone, and all you care about is what other people have run. But as you as your perspective changes, you you learn that these are all people and they're they're striving for the same things as you, and it's it's wonderful. So hopefully, as as time goes by, this will continue, and like you said, that camaraderie will will only improve exactly I always laugh I say I have a, a theory it's called the evolution of the runner you know when you're you first start you're just happy to be able to finish a race and then if you're good enough you might win your age group and then you might win a race and then you're just happy to be you know first masters and then you're happy to be back winning your age group and then you're just happy to be doing age grading so it's just the evolution of a runner it's yep. it's so um, if someone wanted to compete in that, uh, uh, the Masters Championships in uh, Winston-Salem, they, would they just go to the USATF website and look about entering, or is there a qualification? Or? No, no, it's, it's, that's what's great about it. There is no qualification. So if you have a desire, you can go and compete against the best in the country. So you just go to the USATF website, the calendar, look for indoor uh, track and field Masters Championships, and sign up for it. Okay, great. I will put a link to that in our show notes. So be sure to check that out. So that's all my questions. And um, I just had a few questions from some of our Twitter um, followers. And uh, I'm encouraging any of our listeners who are interested in uh, certain topics or certain guests we have to uh, reach out to us and let us know what you would like to know. But from a question from Hampton Runner, uh, he wanted to know, does your husband follow a particular coaching philosophy or have a certain influence when coaching you or how does he come up with your training schedule? Um, he is the brains behind it all. I give him full credit. I always say if it was up to me to read and figure out the workouts, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> so he does it and he lays it out and I say, I'm like Pavlov's dog. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Um, but he uses basically, he'll look at the times, like from the last, let's say, a couple of races that I've done, and he does the calculations and works on it from there. Um, I had fractured my foot. I dropped my granddaughter's high chair tray on my foot in <laughs> August and had a fractured foot, so had to take some time off. So then he had to start at, you know, kind of ground zero and, and work it up again and figure out where I was in the training. So we're always tweaking it. We're always pushing the envelope, you know, and again, coming back to, you know, ultimately it's up to me to listen and say, okay, you know, I need the encouragement and the push because it's easy to get complacent. But, um, he basically uses the numbers and looks at the workouts that I've done. Typically we'll try to do, um, two speed workouts a week and maybe a hill workout. I try to do like a 12 mile run on Sundays um, just to keep the distance up. But that's kind of a, a rough idea of what we do each week. Okay, so he, he's very obviously uh, very naturally talented at it to just come up with his own training schedule. It's not like he follows a particular person. So that's even better because he, he knows you and he understands what works for you and he adapts it based on what you need. Um, and what about racing? Do you feel like you need to race a little bit less than, uh, you have to be careful with not overdoing it with the racing or do you, it, does that change at all as you have become older or you just race when you feel like racing? I try to do all the USATF events. So when I get the calendar, like right now, the calendar is filled out for the year with the races that we can fill in. It's kind of like filling that big jug and you put the boulders in first and then you put the little rocks and the sand. It's kind of filling it in. So the USATF events go in, the world events go in, and then we look at some of the local races. Um, 
yes, I raced less than I used to race. I mean, it was nothing to do two races on a weekend, you know, back years ago. And now it's not that you can't do it, but I think my focus is in a different place. So I try to be selective. I do find that it takes me longer to recover. Yep. Yep. That's, that's kind of what I was going for with one of the questions we had from another, another listener was, uh, yeah, did, does it seem to take you longer to bounce back after those time, after those hard efforts? So you have to be a bit more careful with how often you do it. Yes. It just takes longer to recover. Like before I could go, let's say I go run six or eight miles the next day. Now I might do a five mile run instead, mm -hmm. or I might not run the next day. Um, I also find traveling takes it out of me. It used to be, you know, hop mm -hmm. on a plane, go run, come back. Now it's like, no, I need a day before and I need the day after. So it's little concessions that you make, I think, mm -hmm. along the way. Okay. And just making adjustments as you go, you know, not uh, this whole interview, we've talked about um, learning how to make adjustments, small changes as you go rather than big things. So that's just another another source of proof for that. Yes. So, yes. so I think that's all we have today. So um, thank you, Kathy. We really appreciate listening to you. And I'm sure our readers have learned a lot and will look forward to following your career in the future. Well, thank you so much, Tina. It's been a real pleasure. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.